Okay, so this is recording here. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Most of the people watching this are watching it recorded, so hello to most of you. And then the smaller than usual group today who's watching the, the live version, hello to you as well. Um, for the people watching live, just a reminder to save the all questions or comments until the very until the end when we do our when we do our Q and A and Q and A and discussion about uh, about the session. So, so this is session number six. Uh, we've done five other sessions before this, and today we're going to be talking about leading conversation classes. Um, I think it's something that I've been asked about quite a bit when it comes to teaching um, around conversation classes and how that works. And so I thought I would put together a session on it. The other thing with conversation classes, which is super interesting to me anyway, is I think there's a lot of teachers who view leading conversation classes as a very simple task, which it can be simple, but I think it's deeper than how certain people view it. I think certain people view conversation classes as I go into the class, and we start talking about things. And while that can be true, which we're going to talk about today, it's not, it can actually go a heck of a lot deeper than that. So here's our agenda for today. There's two, there's two resources I want to share uh, immediately right off the bat. I have a tip of the day, which uh, is something that weirdly enough has nothing to do with our topic, but I really wanted to share it today. So we're going to share that tip of the day. We're going to talk about some types of conversation classes. We're going to talk about the class structure per level. So there's different class structures for conversation classes, depending on the level of, um, of the students or students. And then we're going to have a Q&A and discussion portion as, um, as, as always. So let's jump immediately into our, our tip of the day here. So tip of the day, as I said, has nothing to do with our topic, but I just desperately wanted to share it. I literally added the slide, I think, what, an hour ago? Yeah, I added it an hour ago. I was teaching a class, and while I was teaching the class, something happened in the class, and I was like, ah, I need to capture this somewhere, and this PowerPoint was open, and I thought, let's just capture it in the PowerPoint, and we'll just mention it in the, uh, in the, uh, in the PowerPoint today. So the tip of the day is around teaching, which is using, I think it's important to use reading, writing, listening and speaking related strategies to let information sink in for students. So what do I mean by this? Uh, let me tell you a little bit of a story. I was teaching a class earlier today. This is the class where I wrote this in. I wrote, I wrote this slide in. Teaching a class and we've been working on preterito in Spanish. So preterito is a past tense in Spanish for those of you who don't speak Spanish. And we were working, we've been working on this for a number of weeks, roughly three weeks, something like that, two, maybe three weeks. We've been working on it. And we're working on the conjugations and practicing it and different games and exercises. And the information is slowly sinking into the students' brains, but it's not immediately sinking in. There's certain students who you explain something and it's like, oh, they get it really quickly. They literally say to themselves, oh, that's not hard. And then they remember it. And there's certain students where it takes a little bit of extra time for them to, for the information to sink in. These students are probably taking an average amount of time, not more than the average person, not less, just about as, about what you would expect for the information to sink in. So in order for this information to sink in, here's what I did. First, I explained the theory of how to conjugate the preterito. Here are the conjugation rules, and here's when we use the preterito. We then looked at some examples. And we looked at some examples of the preterito being used. Then I gave, we did some practice exercises together. And they kind of struggled their way through it. It was difficult for them. And we did some things together. And we were doing that for basically a whole lesson. We did a lot of mostly, I would say, speaking and writing oriented exercises. Maybe some reading as well when we did some, when we looked at some examples. But I would say primarily speaking. Um, writing, and then a little bit of reading. The next class, they still could not remember the conjugations. So I was like, what is going on? They're not remembering. And, and they remember a lot less than I actually thought than they would. I thought they'd have remembered more by that next class, but they really couldn't remember. And I was like, huh, 
So then we listen to a song about the Preterito on YouTube. This song is super cringy in the sense that it's very cheesy. Um, and we watched it. And they're like, oh my God, they're, these, they're, they're teenagers. These, they're like young teenagers. So they're like, oh my God, this is so cheesy and so lame. And I was like, yep, it is. Let's listen to it again. They're like, no. And we listened to it probably, we listened to the chorus probably 10 times within that lesson. Literally every time they forgot a conjugation, it was like a punishment in quotations. Not a real punishment, but, and they, they'd be like, oh my God, the song again. Oh. Right? So that was a strategy. That would be probably more of a listening strategy to help that sink in. Then we did, uh, we, we, re we read a book about a lady who swallows a fly. It's a children's book, very, very popular children's book. And we read the Spanish version. There's a lot of preterito in the book. We looked at that. We read that book. Then today in the class, we did some writing. I literally made them do, I made them do a very boring writing drill, super boring writing drill. Um, where they just had to just out of rote memory, just write out some verbs. It wasn't the whole class, but it was a portion of the class. Then we did some speaking exercises. So all I'm saying is we're revisiting the same topic, which is preterito, using speaking, using listening, using writing, using, we haven't done a lot of reading, a little bit. We had the one book that we read, a little bit of reading, probably could do a little bit more reading to be honest, but as I'm thinking on it, I'm thinking on it in hindsight. We listen to a song. So we've used multiple different strategies, right? One or two reading strategies, one, uh, two writing strategies, one primary listening strategy. We've done a couple of speaking strategies to help reinforce the same concept. So when you're teaching, I, I believe this is a very important thing to be doing. As I said, nothing to do with leading conversation classes, not really, but it's something that occurred to me while I was teaching earlier. And I was like, I really want to capture this and share this in some way. So here it is in our slide today. Okay, so right off the bat, I want to share some resources. And now we're getting into the conversation side of things. We're getting really on the topic of today, um, which is the resource, uh, I'm sorry, the leading conversation classes. Two resources I, I think will immediately help you, immediately every single one of you that ever needs to lead a conversation class. The first one, if you go into Google and you just search topics for language exchange, um, you're going to find lots of websites. And they're going to give you all sorts of different, um, all sorts of different websites that give you topics and conversation starters. They are designed for language exchanges. So we've talked about that before. But a language exchange, in case you don't know what it is, Basically, it's where you help someone learn your first language and they help you learn their first language. But it, it works very, very well for conversation classes as well. You can start to pick out some of those topics and that gives you something to talk about. And the second one is just the following website, this iteslj.org slash questions. Oh my goodness, this is the most, I can't take credit for this website. It's one of my, it's my German my German teacher who actually pointed this out to me and he's the one who shared it. And he's like, Azrin, you might like this. And it's amazing. I've sent it to all, all the Calgary language nerds teachers and it's, it's just wonderful. It has a huge list of different topics ranging from very simple things like, you know, day to day, like I think it was like Halloween on the website. There's like, um, there's like uh, animals. But then there's also things that are more like that are deeper. There's like, I think there's like a gender topic, like gender, uh, gender roles and the gay community and generation gaps and poverty and like plagiarism. There's so many different questions. Some of them are more surface level. Some are more, I suppose, deeper and more advanced. And it's a really good website that I've only really known about for the past week, maybe one or two weeks, something like that. And so just to, it just goes to show the longer you teach and the more you teach and the, the more you try to improve, the better you get, the more resources you come across. And, and yeah, you're always, always growing. Good teachers are always growing, I think. So <clears throat> when we look at conversation classes, the very first thing that I like to look at is if, we're talk, if, this, if it's going to be a general conversation class or if it's a goal-oriented conversation class. That's the first thing that I think it's important to look at. In my personal experience, 
the vast majority of conversation classes tend to fall more into the category of general conversation where you have a less you have lessons maybe they're private maybe they're group and you end up talking about a wide variety of topics the teacher might prepare a specific topic or specific topics to discuss maybe you come into the class with topics that you would like to discuss regardless there's one or multiple topics that you're talking about in the lessons and these are great i think general conversation classes are are are, are fine i don't have an issue with them whatsoever now goal oriented conversation classes are a little bit different this is where you select one topic and you and the goal is to become pro, and the goal for the student or the students is to become proficient about that one topic and they can talk about that topic and answer questions about that topic and engage in conversations about that topic with a reasonably high degree of fluency that sun is getting in my eyes i'm just going to shift this over just a bit there we go that sunshine directly in my eyeballs <laughs> okay um my personal thoughts as of today is that both of these are fine whether it's a goal oriented conversation class or a general conversation class i do think both of them are fine to be honest i don't really have any qualms with either any any problems with either i will say that as of today my gut says that goal oriented classes tend to be better and they tend to be more effective Number one, the student can see their progress. They can notice their progress because they can notice after, you know, eight weeks of class or four weeks or twelve weeks or whatever, they can really actually notice and feel the difference of oh my goodness, seven weeks ago I couldn't talk about this topic, and now I actually can. Wow! Versus general conversation, you don't feel that progress as much because you're bouncing around topics so much that even though they're improving. they're improving on such a wide spectrum of topics that they don't feel the improvement for a long time they don't you don't feel it as much um so my my knee jerk reaction as of today is that goal oriented is a little bit of a better way to go but i'm not so convinced in that statement for me to say it with full confidence and to be like yes i'm open to other people having you know i suppose counter arguments to that um and i that's something i haven't fully made up my mind on so i've got a sample here this is a sample for a goal oriented class not a general class so this is actually modified but there's a certain student that has taken classes with us in the past and um i've kind of modified this a bit to use it as an example or a sample for today and so this is for a student who was taking some conversation classes and this is a very goal oriented approach so we had some major very measurable kinds of goals that we're working on over the next that we were going to work on or rather we were working on um for i believe it was 2 or 3 months i can't remember so the first goal was a vocabulary oriented goal so it's 25 plus new words so learn 25 plus new words related to the environment um it's important for them to understand those words so aka listening and use them speaking I apologize if this is kind of this bullet points a bit tough to understand. These these are just taken on my personal notes and I slightly modified them, took some names out so that we don't mention their name in the in the PowerPoint and what not, but I'll try and explain best I can. So the goal was 25 plus new words related to the environment, right? So they want to be able um, the goal was for the student to be able to understand those words and also use them. They're going to the student if this is the goal we're working on, the student's probably going to learn more than 25 new words. but the goal is that we really want 25 new words that that they deeply know that they can actually use it and they understand it without too much of a mental struggle on the conversational side i have a goal here what is be able to ask and answer 10 plus common questions that someone may ask on the topic of the environment and they should be able to ask and answer these questions in at least two different variations So if you think about the environment, right? Maybe a common question might be, "Oh, what do you think of climate change nowadays?" You know, do you think Canada is doing enough to um or do you think the globe, the planet as a whole, countries are doing enough to combat climate change? Do you think climate change is real? What should we do to protect the environment? On and on. We pick 10 different common questions, right? 
that someone may ask or that you may want to ask about the environment. And the key here is that it shouldn't just be that you've memorized the questions and that you've memorized these rote memorized answers. That's not how it should be. It should be that you're able to naturally talk about those with a reasonable degree of confidence, which means that you have to be able to ask those questions in multiple variations. Because maybe instead of saying climate change, instead of saying, what are your thoughts on climate change? Someone might say instead, what do you think about climate change? Right? So those questions is, and the meaning of the questions is the same, but the wording is slightly different. So you can't just rote memorize one way to phrase it. You have to, at least you have to have a couple of versions in your head of how it might be asked. Right? And on the listing side, you know, we had watched and be able to understand 85% plus of two or more videos that talk about environmental issues that the student initially was only able to understand less than 50% of. And so this is also something that's part of their, their goals for this particular student. And so this would be a very goal oriented approach to a, to a conversation, to a conversation class. And as I said before, as of today, my hypothesis is that this is a much more effective approach to a conversation class than, um, than just general, let's just chat about stuff, right? I think as a general whole, this will tend to be more effective. One little caveat maybe I'll throw in, you know, for general conversation, I will say that maybe, I think it is important to understand where this, the mentality of the student around the language itself. Like if they're just, if the student just wants a, a, someone just to chat with and have a buddy, it might be too much pressure to have that kind of a goal in their mind, to have that goal that you're working towards. That might not be how they want to work on it. Like, so I do think there's a place for general conversation. I don't want to downplay it too much. I do think it can be very good. And I think there's a place. I just think that if we're using it as a default blanket statement, I, th I do think goal oriented can be a little bit more effective in terms of how quickly a student learns and progresses. Okay, it's important to realize that student level matters. So the student's level matters a lot. A beginner student or intermediate student or you know, the level that they have is going to heavily influence, heavily influence how the class is structured, what topics you talk about. If you're using a goal-oriented approach as we did up here, the goal you set is going to be very different, very, very different if they're you know, more on the beginner side than they are you know, someone who's very, very advanced. Um, a quick little anecdote, I, starting next week, I'm actually taking some French and Spanish classes myself, and I'm very, very advanced in French and Spanish, extremely advanced in French and Spanish. And so they are a conversation class, they're going to be conversation class, but it's going to be, like, even this goal set here would make no sense for me. Maybe the vocabulary, maybe there's some vo vocabulary I could pull out of it, maybe there's something there. But be able to ask and answer 10 plus common questions that someone may ask on the topic of, you can pick any topic and I could ask her, I could easily ask and answer 10 plus common questions. That's a, that's, I can do it in my sleep in French and Spanish, right? Be able to watch and understand 85% of two videos on some issue. Throw any video in front of me, I'll most likely understand 85% of it or more on the first watch through for the most, for the most part, unless they have an accent I'm not used to, or it's really some obscure topic I don't know much about, or like maybe then not, but generally speaking, pfft, I'm gonna be fine. Like that's not, I don't, that's not gonna be good for me versus someone beginner. Like this would be too hard for someone who's very beginner. So it's important to consider the student's level or the, you know, the student's level because that's gonna heavily impact how, how the class is structured. On the beginner side, I've made a list of topics here that you might cover. So on the beginner side, you might talk about work, hobbies, you know, past or future plans, um, maybe family. Oh, I put work there twice. I just noticed work is there twice. Um, work, you know, descriptions, being able to describe something, talking about ordering food in a restaurant, taxi, like if you're traveling. Favorites, so like what's your favorite book? What's your favorite movie? Why is it your favorite movie? What do you like about it? Maybe your region, shopping, there's an endless list of beginner topics you might pick. But I, what I want to point out is all of these are very concrete topics. Your work, that's something you, it's a real tangible thing. Your hobbies is a very real tangible thing. Like if you like playing whatever, volleyball, 
like it's a very tangible thing. It's a real sport versus what you're going to see in a moment in the intermediate things. You know, we might get into some hypothetical questions, right? Things that are not real and tangible, but more hypothetical. You'll also notice in the beginner thing, some of these follow social scripts. So what, let's talk about this. What is a social script? Well, a social script is, an, is basically an agreed upon, an unconsciously agreed upon structure for, con for conversation that would happen in a day-to-day -day, -day situation. So let's talk about a restaurant, for example. When you go to a restaurant, there's a social script around a restaurant. You know that when, they, when you enter, they're going to greet you. You know unconsciously they're probably going to ask you how many people are dining. One people, one person, two people, three people. They're probably going to ask you that. They're probably going to say, after you say, table for two, they're going to say, okay, this way, please. Or maybe they're going to say, ooh, we have a, a one and a half hour wait today. Is that okay? You have these things unconsciously in your mind because you've been to a restaurant so many times. Or in a taxi, there's a social script on taxis. Right? You're going to tell them where to go. They're going to tell you the price. You're going to pay. You're going to, there's, a, there's almost like a script, that a social script, right? And so a lot of beginner topics tend to have social scripts. Even past future plans, it's not exactly a social script, but there's patterns around it. There's a pattern around sharing what you did, what you're going to be doing. Because guess what? We don't have very exciting lives for the most part. We do the same things every week. We, we're not very exciting for the most part. So once you're able to share your past and future plans and you do it seven times and you get seven repetitions or I don't know how many, but multiple repetitions, you're gonna, that's going to become pretty natural because you're, you're going to get comfortable with the verbs in those sentences. You're going to get comfortable with those phrases of, oh, I taught some classes today. Oh, I taught French today. Oh, I, I went, uh, went to my grandparents' house. Oh, I, I ate pizza. I, like, you know, you're going to get used to those pretty quickly. And so with these beginner things often... They have social scripts or they have patterns. They're either social scripts, simple patterns where it's a couple of phrases you use a lot, or they're things that are very concrete and maybe not super, super duper complex to talk about. So these are some beginner topics I usually work with. Now, once you enter intermediate and advanced, we get into some, some more challenging uh, areas. So one category is hypothetical questions, which we have on the left-hand side. So there's three types of hypothetical questions I generally default into. And actually, to be honest, I probably default more into number two and three. I don't even do a lot of would you rather. I probably should do more of that, to be honest. I personally default more into two and three. Like, what would you have done if blah, 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 blah? Like, if, if, um, if you'd never gone to university, what would have you done instead? Or, you know, what would have you done if uh, your boss hadn't fired you? Like, do you think you'd still be working in that company today? Anything hypothetical goes Im shoots immediately super high up in difficulty. Um, and maybe that's not the case in every language. Maybe in certain languages that's not the case. But in my personal experience, that tends to be the case for a wide variety of languages. It's a lot harder to talk about things that are hypothetical than things that are very, you know, concrete. I'll be honest, in French and Spanish specifically, um, English as well, to be honest, uh, English, French, Spanish, Mandarin, let me think. I don't, have, I don't have experience teaching Mandarin on this kind of level because my personal level is not high enough to teach at that level. So I, don't, I can't speak from experience there. But I can very confidently say French, Spanish, and English these hypo hypothetical questions is not even going to intermediate intermediate um, levels. I usually reserve that more for upper intermediate or even lower advanced. So people that really tend to have a good grasp of present and past and future and and they they speak reasonably fluently. They can talk about their work no struggles. When you talk to them at a natural speed, they usually understand you. They they have a good base of vocabulary. That's when I start to get into here because that starts to push them into cat into territory where they're not used to, and tends to be hard. Especially, you know, Spanish. Especially, the grammar around this is real wonky and real tricky for people. Not that easy. The other type of topic we'll have is this deeper topics, deeper deeper conversation topics, things that are going to be longer conversations. And for example, how do you eat in a restaurant? How do you take a taxi? What's your favorite book? They're going to be much more longer conversations. 
education, politics, religion, history, economy, you know, storytelling and fiction. Maybe this could be actually be one bullet point, not two. That's an interesting one too. When we look at economy, history, religion, politics, education, these are very heavy topics and storytelling might not seem to initially fit within that list of topics, which is interesting. But it does, because storytelling, when you read fiction books or children's books or fiction of any kind, you enter, there's a lot of vocab that enters into there that you've never seen before. Like every single one of us knows, what's a good example? When we're kids, right? A, a vast, a good percentage of us when we're kids, we hear or we listen to or we watch or we've read stories about knights. Knights who go on adventures and they defeat the dragon and they save the princess and they whatever right these kinds of dragons and so what happens we learn words like princess sword shield dragon adventure related words magic wand right he uh chopped the dragon's head off or whatever we learn these words but here's the thing think about that in our actual day-to-day -day conversations we don't use those words anymore we don't talk about we don't talk about you know, swords and shields and armor and dragons and princesses and castles. We don't really talk about that. So what happens is at an intermediate level, you're lacking a lot of words that any native speaker is going to know, but you don't know because you just didn't have that childhood in the language. You didn't have that childhood. So you never got into those. Leveling it up just a little bit. Let's go into like even just books. Like I'm reading George Orwell's 1984 right now. And let me tell you, if I was reading that in French or Spanish, I would need a dictionary. There's a lot of words in that book that are hard. Like, uh, what's a good example? Like, um, like hubris. Hubris is a word I, I've never used in my life, but I know what it means. I've read it. I know it, right? Or like, um, what's another example? Like uh, scathing. I just, the, I just learned the word scathing. Is it scathing or scabbing? Anyway, I think it's scathing. Scathing. I just learned that word in French the other day. I just learned it. And when you read fiction you know, more fiction than nonfiction. Nonfiction, you don't see it as much, but fiction, when you read it, you get these words that, you know, the average educated native speaker would just know. They would know them very, very well, but you don't know. And so fiction books can often be a good, fiction books and stories in general often are, can be a good place to go for intermediate and advanced as well. So, um, and, um, yeah, I think maybe the final thing I'll, I'll say before we get to our questions and discussions. Um, I think, you know, one thing to look at when you're at the intermediate to advanced level and maybe more into the advanced. Intermediate, not as much, but advanced, the closer you get to advanced, it definitely happens. When you get close to that advanced level where you tend, you know, how do I say this? The more beginner you, when you're at a beginner level, even intermediate at times, you know, there's a lot of grammar you don't know. There's a lot of words you don't know. There's expressions you don't know. You have problems like people talk too fast. You have problems like you can't put your words together. There's a wide variety of problems you have. When you're close to that advanced level, you don't have that wide variety of problems anymore. You only have a couple of problems, right? And those couple might be different for different people, but when you're at that level, you have to understand that there's a couple things they almost always miss and they're always lacking. One, vocabulary. They are lacking. The average educated native speaker is going to know a ton more words than the average advanced speaker of the language. Even though when you stick them side by side and they're just talking and stuff, you don't see that difference. Like if you throw me a bunch of native Spanish speakers and we're just hanging out and chatting, you're probably not going to see the difference much. Every now and then I might not know a word, but generally I'm going to be fine. You're not going to, someone from the outside might be like, wow, Azarin talks just like them. He's keeping up. But if you get us in front of a book, you know, if Rebecca or someone is reading a Spanish book, like she's a miles ahead of me because her vocab is just, her passive vocabulary is much higher than mine. Passive vocabulary, meaning words she doesn't use, but she knows what they mean. Just like my passive vocabulary is going to be better than the average English learner, even if they're super advanced. Because I know even though I might not use the word scathing, I know what scathing means. I don't know, I don't use the word hubris, but I know what hubris means, etc. So, okay, so we're gonna transition. I think our Q and A portion is gonna be a little bit shorter today because we're a very small group on the live session, but regardless, if people have questions on the session, I'm happy to chat about them and answer. For people watching recorded, um, 
um, you are, what was I going to say, recorded people. Thanks for watching, I suppose. And uh, let's finish up there. See you guys.